Exactly why the hell is America's public transportation so terrible? That's today's big question, and my guest is Nicholas Duggan Bloom. He is the author of the subtly titled new book, The Great American Transit Disaster. Nicholas is a professor of urban policy and planning at Hunter College. He is the author of a bunch of books, including Public Housing That Worked, The Metropolitan Airport, and How States Shaped Postwar America. He's also the co-editor of the prize-winning Public Housing Myths and Affordable Housing in New York. This new book, The Great American Transit Disaster, out now, very deep dive into how we got here. And importantly, where I've really understood for the first time through Nick's overwhelming evidence that, as he puts it, transit divestment was a choice rather than destiny, with a lot of actors involved. Welcome to Important Not Important. My name is Quint Emmett, and this is science for people who give a shit. In these weekly conversations, I'm so lucky to take a deep dive with an incredible human like Nick, who's working on the front lines of the past and the future to build a radically better today and tomorrow for everyone. Along the way, uh, you and I are going to discover tips, strategies, and stories, and a lot of evidence you can use to get involved, to understand problems, and to undo them, to become uh, better and more effective for yourself, and to help us unfuck this entire thing. So please enjoy my conversation with Nick. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for hopping on. Thanks so much. It's an honor to be here. The plan today is to read your book line by line, page by page to people. How long do you think that might take? Uh, 120,000 words. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. But um, <laughs> I don't know if you saw this week, and I'm totally forgetting the gentleman's name, the gentleman who edited all of Caro's books about Moses and Lyndon B. Johnson. Yeah. And talking, they were telling, he passed away this week, and they were telling the story about how they, the first draft of, what was it? Power. The power broker it might have been the power broker, or it was the first Linda. The point was the first draft foolish. was a million words, and they cut four hundred thousand <laughs> words out. And you're just like, oh my god, like, this was what? longer. I should warn you, this book was longer. And my editor did go to me. And he said, you know, we didn't give you this much, this much runway for this thing. You got to bring it down. So I did, it and it was impressive. better for it. I have it, to say, it's fantastic. You showed your work, and that really matters. Look, there's yeah. a time for fluff, and there's a time for not, and you got yeah. it all out there. I mean, one thing, by the way, why it gets longer is it's six cities. Yeah. You know, if you take that 120,000 words across six cities, like a lot of like traditional history books, you know, it'll be like one city and they're trying to, we try to prove everything like with one city, but you got to really look at the national picture. So that's why I did six cities. Yeah. And that's really important because obviously our cities are very different. This is just a complicated country and right. all right. those things, they're all moving goalposts and changing over time. And the demographics changed entirely and you know, very different geographies mm -hmm. and all this different stuff, but also it just gives it context, you know, in yeah. my sense. So when I look at things like, so we're working with a group to try to write some very basic policy stuff that is transplantable across local cities and towns based on so in France, they basically, which it's easier, it's a little more homogenous, more homogenous. They just, one of their climate things is any parking lot over 80 spots has to have solar over it now. That's the, and so we're looking at that going, okay, adapt that to, it's never going to pass federally, clearly, right? And even on the state level and stuff, but how can we do that in towns and cities, but also look mm -hmm. at big box stores? Okay, mm -hmm. any roof over this size? because the centralized solar and stuff is just gonna be more difficult lift. So how do we build these things, but also work on it with transmission so that we can look at these things and go, yes, every city and town is differently and every situation is different, but what is- That's doable, of, that's yeah, doable. doable. You can look like, at, you can look at zoning law it was the same totally. thing in the 20s. They came up with a kind of the national government, the federal government came up with a model you know, legislation. And then, you know, it was adapted by different totally. states and then all the local governments followed from those states. So definitely doable to have successful yeah, it's just like, national how do, we, how do we give people like, a, I don't want to say like lowest common denominator, but like these are the 10 things you can take to your city council to at least start the conversation, you know, because it's pretty tough for regular folks to walk into these things and say, what do I say? Like what, much less, what mm -hmm. is the most effective way to get my foot in the door? So mm -hmm. anyways, anyways, yes, it's helpful to show six cities over 120,000 words. <laughs> I thought it was great. Nick, we yeah. ask everybody one question to get started. It's a little ridiculous, but I usually get pretty great answers. So the question is, why are you vital to the survival of the species? 
heard you. <laughs> Why am I personally? I don't, I don't You got to be bold and honest here. <sighs> okay. Certainly, this is a clarion call. You know, the last week or two in New York area, for instance, we had just a really frightening wake up call about, you know, the impacts on our quality of life with the smoke, you know, from the Quebec fires. And, you know, you can look at, you know, not for nothing, but 100 years of auto oriented, you know, development with no op, very few options for transit really developed in the United States. That is a direct contributor, right, to whether we have more smoke filled days. And there, there's no question about it, especially because transportation has become one of the leading sources of greenhouse gas emission in the US. Mm -hmm. So to the extent I can rally people <laughs> to, you know, invest in transit, even at this lowest point, right? Because actually what we see is, and I think it's just like this really important moment, right? And that they've had before with transit in the, like the 1940s and 50s. It's at the crisis moment is when you invest, right? Yeah. Because when you're down, that's when you can rebuild from there. Yeah. It is. And we're getting pretty low. Things are orange <laughs> everywhere. Uh, no, yeah. Literally the sky is orange. Yes. It's not ideal, and it is helpful to finally have someone, the definitive take, almost in a way that, and again, not to diminish your work, and in a way we can go, look, this is settled now. Let's take what we can to learn from it mm -hmm. and apply that going forward instead mm -hmm. of constantly arguing about the why of how we got right. here and the how right. of God we are. Here's how it is. Here's how it went across the six most applicable cities, and let's move forward, you know, yeah. because there's... Again, I just spent 15 years in Los Angeles. I sat there and had to deal with them expanding the 405 for yeah. what, however long that took. It was completely yeah. insane. That's how I got to my mother-in-law's house. It yeah. was crazy. As much of a nightmare is as Los Angeles is public transportation-wise, you look at something like Atlanta and you go... Oh, yeah. LA's paradise. It's, it's they have a incredible. tremendous... LA's got a solid you know, bus system, slow, but it has it. They are expanding their, their rail network. I mean, not as many people are using it as possible, but from what I understand, their bus system has come back pretty strong overall. Yeah. So, so there is opportunity. Yeah. I wanted to share a brief story to get us to, to mm -hmm. where we're going here. Again, about 15 years ago in Los Angeles, I had just lived in New York and Spain and London and was raised here. There's no real public transportation. I mean, there's yeah. horses that walk by occasionally. But my wife throws a birthday party. My future wife throws a birthday party. And I don't recall who I was talking to, which is probably important because I keep telling everyone this story. And I don't remember the context of the conversation, except for that it was about the pluses and minuses of public transportation and how much I enjoyed using them. All I remember is at the end, she said, but then when you get off the subway, you'd have to walk to where you're going. <laughs> and I thought of that immediately because in the intro to your book, you said, and I'll quote here, transit agencies go through the motions of printing schedules and deploying buses or trains, but their service has become irrelevant to most Americans. Yeah. And that's just the thing. In many of our big cities, again, you talked about six of them and the national outlook, public transportation might be an option. And in a couple, it's even popular. But in right. some of those, and in many others, it's actually just that. It's like not even a consideration for so It's many. maybe one or 2%. Yeah. More people are often walking or biking 100%. in many American cities. Which than... is great, but- <laughs> We're not but, against but, that. <laughs> right, no, we need all of the things. Right. But so I wanted to actually start with this part, which I'm curious about. We're gonna take this deep dive into why things are the way they are. But now, in 2023, which is not really what your book is about, how do you feel like public awareness and perception might actually be any part of the problem at all? Oh, that's a good one. I mean, one is I do think there are improvements in public awareness of the value of transit in the last few years. And I actually think social media has been very good in bringing a new awareness for and also a tool for transit advocates in that. On the other hand, right, transit has a number of kind of built in problems, like most public institutions. For one thing, they have press offices. That's not good. Press offices are a big problem because if anything goes wrong, right, you know, it's an easy story. It's an easy article for the kind of, if it bleeds, it leads, you know, nighttime reporting. So you get basically anyone who's not riding transit gets the worst possible takes on transit, some in some cities every day. 
you know, even though in a city like New York, between January and April this year, 90 some people have been killed in in car related accidents and 19,000 injured. Mm -hmm. That is a kind of a statistic and a kind of situation that is not easily reportable. If a train derails, if somebody's held up, if there's an issue right on transit, that's like a this very kind of like sensational moment. And you fill right a year of sensational moments on transit and good luck. Good luck getting people in there. I mean, so that's one. You know, that, that's the, the image is not there. The other, you know, there are other image issues, I think. You know, the who of riding transit in so many American cities, primarily non-white populations riding transit in many American cities, waiting for buses and, you know, bus stops that have no like shade protection, you know, delayed buses and service and so forth. And for a very long time, since transit was disinvested in the 1940s and 50s in the U.S., you know, transit was slower, you know, in most American cities and less reliable than having a car. And so that's another, I think people just like experience, like they see, they don't see a lot of transit and the transit that they see in reality is often, you know, one bus here and there. And they don't think to themselves, oh, you know, yeah, you know, I could do that. You know, I could ride that bus, right? But if you see, you know, if you're like in most American suburbs where most Americans live, maybe they see a bus, at, I don't know when, maybe not ever, you know, like yeah. once an hour. Whereas you go to even a place like Canada, you go to Toronto or a place like that, they got buses going all over their suburbs and places like that. So I think between the kind of media framing as, you know, transits, this horrible, dangerous thing, and look at what COVID. You remember those early COVID memes and things like that about transit? It was like, everyone's getting it on, you know, because it started, you know, so much started in New York and it's like, you're going to get it in, you know, transit. So that media narrative was, you know, the danger. Transit is fundamentally dangerous. And then the other side of it, which is that people don't have any other countervailing information. And what they see is often not very positive. The media is the worst, aware of that. But it is also interesting. It's, it is one of those, and again, having, I was, you know, lived in all these transit happy places and used it and it was fantastic and then spent all this time in Los Angeles. And then <laughs> it's one of the, almost one of those things like how do you get a job because experience begets experience, but how do you get experience if no one will give mm -hmm. you the job? And I remember a new soccer team started in Los Angeles and they play, I don't know how much time you've spent there, if at all. But they, they built this brand new stadium. Yeah, it's fantastic. the SoFi Stadium. Well, oh, that's the football oh, team. One, this is the soccer team, sorry. the LAFC. Sorry. It's, you're the worst. You're the worst. <laughs> There's uh, a transit story related to SoFi, too. Oh, God, I'm sure. Yeah. Talk about knocking down 700,000 homes. So they played down near USC. Okay. And I remember I got season tickets, and I was really excited. And then I realized, I was like, driving down there is going to be a huge pain in the ass. Getting out of there is going to I mean, Dodger Stadium, it's a nightmare. I was like, I'm not doing that. Yeah. And I realized there's actually a red line stop not too far from where i lived i couldn't quite e-bike there mm. without dying but i could drive and park there and i could take the red line and i could switch and i could go there and i was like mm. i've been here for 12 years and i've never done this but yeah is it going to work and i remember taking it and they designed it to their credit so that you walk in you go past the science museum and you go through the rose garden you walk up to the stadium and then you walk back out and you go and they got cops directing everybody to the subway yeah, yeah. and it's super great and i was like this is what it could be it's so great, but it's yeah. really easy to look at a map, again, like Los Angeles, just the subway, and the buses have gotten better, and go, this doesn't go anywhere near my home. Why would I ever even try it? I mean, that's the, when you look at American cities, you you have a better chance of getting to a stadium <laughs> on a yeah. rail line right. in the U.S. Because there is, and that has to do with the politics behind transit, which is that if you're going to sell, you know, a very expensive transit investment very often, it's regional, and it's like most suburbanites never ride transit. So you're like, hey. You know what we're going to do? We're going to run this transit by the stadium, right? Or by this big hospital complex or, you know, like these major sites, even though, quite frankly, although soccer might be better, I don't know how heavy the season is, but you won't get a lot of use like on a daily basis. Oh, sure. You get this sort like of episodic. Right. But I will say this, baseball stadiums are better. You know, they have actually they a lot of games. They are actually pretty good. But the football stadium ones, which you'll just see all across the country, you'll see the light rail running to the football stadium. It's like, you know, I don't even know how many games that is at home, but it's not many. It's a nightmare. Um, but it can be like, done. As you point out, it absolutely can be done. You can think about it. It's not cheap. It's got to be subsidized. And you know, that's how it goes. So let's talk a little bit about why this conversation is so important besides just public transportation is great and driving is a nightmare. 
anyone listening and killing the planet right yeah exactly i mean anyone listening to this understands that smog greenhouse gas emissions of every kind coming off tires tires yes water pollution just blew through all the non-white neighborhoods with highways yeah like you said traffic violence is a nightmare these are choices we've made and right. what you did is you directly took on this idea, and it's legendary whenever you walk around Los Angeles, which is car companies killed this utopian right. public transit place. And your point was it really was about us. It was about city and state leaders and mm-hmm. planners and voters saying we're not going to do it, and we're not definitely not going to pay for it. And I'm very right. interested in these levers of power like we were discussing offline across sort of the portfolio of what we talk about here. Yeah. Because our most effective avenues of change are gonna be the same levers. So you highlighted three sort of tent poles and then illustrated them across the cities of why mm-hmm. things went down the way they did. And I wanna reverse the order you've got them in the book and start with white flight. So yeah. as far as I understand from your book, and again, you tried to make it pretty clear, transit was pretty darn white for a long time. Yes. And then it became less, and that's seemingly where a lot of these problems began. Can you talk to us right. a little bit about that? Yes. Before the major era of white flight in the 1940s and 50s, you know, your average transit rider in American City was a white worker, working maybe middle class, riding streetcars, buses, electric trolley coaches, and so forth. When riding, you know, when we talk about, it's basically the sort of, you know, high point of American transit goes from really the 1880s to the 1920s and 30s. And, you know, it was a white phenomenon. And around what's really interesting about that era is that's when you get this whole kind of neighborhood complex of the kind of white ethnic neighborhoods that grew up around transit, whether they're rapid lines or streetcars, trolley coach lines of stores and businesses and so forth that grew up around those areas. As white people left these neighborhoods, though, as the neighborhoods, basically as African-Americans migrated north or migrated to cities in the south, white residents left those neighborhoods behind for either kind of more suburban type development within the city limits or the suburbs themselves. And because they maintained, even though they were leaving, the white populations maintained political power into the 1960s in most American cities. And that's crucial because it was very clear from the 1930s to the 1960s, that the private transit companies were basically bleeding the systems dry. And that the only way to save this whole apparatus of Mm -hmm. good transit would be to either subsidize the private companies, right? Or basically take over, have municipal ownership, which was not unknown at the time. And the white power structure in these cities during this time basically said, we're not doing it. Right. And the voters, the white voters who were dominant in this period, as there was this era of transition, but it was still white dominated, they had no interest when asked to vote for bonds for transit, they rejected them. And so what happens is as transit's ridership shifts, because the neighborhoods, the African-American neighborhoods were the ones that had the most transit, right, they were really set up well for transit as those areas became African-American, the private companies that were running the good transit there began disinvesting steeply in their transit operations. And they didn't also extend them to the suburbs where these white people were moving with the cars and so forth. And so what you end up with is a steeply declining public, first private and then public resource in what were increasingly primarily African-American neighborhoods. And, you know, that even after a while, you know, anyone, even African-American residents abandoned transit in so many cities. If they could get cars, they did. And so that's a really crucial part of this story. And, you know, as neighborhoods were disinvested, you also had fewer riders available in the neighborhoods that had the most transit infrastructure. You can look at like, I've got these maps like of West Side of you know, mm-hmm. Baltimore and Atlanta, and places like that, which basically you can see that the neighborhoods that had the most riders were the East and West Sides, which had increasingly an African-American majority population. And, you know, between 1960 and 2000, they also lose a lot of their riders too in that period. It's a flywheel, right? And you talked about, and we'll get into like how these really were forced to be these pay-as-you-go systems. And, you know, you get white voters and people in power who who stop writing it and thus, and then refuse to subsidize it. And then it starts to fall apart and only black people are using it. And then 
it becomes just a shittier mode of transportation because it's not kept up with. And so fewer people are using it. And so fewer people are paying for it. And it's still not being subsidized even more. And then you've got right. examples like the, I remember being so excited to highlight this point in in your one of your parts on Atlanta. Obviously, ger- gerrymandering is not, it's obviously such a huge piece of the puzzle today with everything yeah. we're dealing with. And you made this point about Atlanta annexing Fulton County, which was very white, and them not only not building out there, but it effectively added, what was it, like 600,000 new white voters. Yeah, to maintain the white majority yeah, in the city. Yeah, so- And white majority in a landscape that was increasingly auto-centric. Because the other part of that is, and you hit, you indicated that too, is that in so, almost every American city, almost, right, these new emergent white, either urban areas through annexation or these white suburbs, right, were areas where the car was dominant. So good luck, right, you know, getting like high quality transit out of drivers. It's very difficult to do, you know, I, it's a pretty heavy load because their transit needs are taken care of. I mean, their transportation needs are taken care of without transit. They don't need it. And then the city governments in this period were just totally all in on not just highways, by the way, you know, you'll see a lot, you go to a lot of American cities, you see a lot of parkways right? Or why street widening was big in Atlanta. You mentioned that, you know, that they create, they recreate either the central cities to be more car friendly, Mm -hmm. or they create whole areas where you move so frictionless, you know, through areas, except at rush hours or places like, you know, like that. It's so frictionless for everyday life on the car that to translate or to to, not translate, but to exchange, right? The frictionlessness of a car with that of transit it's asking a lot right it's such a crucial period for that too because obviously we know what a nightmare traffic is now as a personal and as a yeah atlanta i mean god greenhouse gases but as you talked about there were all these beautiful parkways and then people they became like it went from a sunday drive to (laughs) we're going to use these for transportation great now we're going to widen them and we're going to plow down even more stuff and that was the same period when you've got segregation coming apart in some ways mm-hmm. and in some cities but not all of them and when you're defunding these things and it's when you integrate transit in atlanta people are all you know a lot of the white people i mean that's another factor it's not just you know the disinvestment itself or movement but when in the south you had the mandated integration of transit that's another factor right driving whites further out right and the way they protect themselves is through primarily through zoning Right. They create environments which, because of the socioeconomic differences, both then and now between a large portion of the white and black population, basically create these large, very expensive homes or comparatively expensive homes. Very hard to serve single family home areas effectively, not impossible, but very hard to serve them effectively with transit, certainly not with unsubsidized transit. And so they create a whole world, right, that is is transit hostile, I guess I would say. And that helps protect the privilege that white people had achieved in basically, you know, being financed for these new homes and so forth through the federal government and also private enterprise. And it's not just the residential part, which is important, but yeah, at one point you described, you know, a relatively early Chicago where, Mm -hmm. I think I have the quote here. Again, this sort of stuck with me with my Los Angeles experience where you said, Long neighborhood commercial strips parallel streetcar and elevated lines and stops, with notable clusters as diagonal cross streets, where 75% of neighborhood communities and shopping centers developed around transfer points or terminals of transit routes. Now, I thought about the, again, about 15 years where I lived right near Ventura Boulevard in Los Angeles, which I think by some accounts, and it might be a myth, is the longest contiguous stretch of commercial real estate on the planet, I think. Yeah. And there is no protected bus lane. There is yeah. no subway. There is no streetcar. There isn't even a protected bike lane. And yeah. you just look at that and go, what? <laughs> like, how? And there's residences, you know, on either side of it. You've got sure. the hills on one side. But again, you read about what the most effective way is. And this was so much of what the zoning situation was in California the past 10 years is yeah. allowing upscaling in transit defined areas where it already is to try to improve existing yeah. systems, which I know you talked a lot about wasted money. On yeah. That. And there's that new legislation allowing for residential development, all in those commercial districts. Right. 
Right. The pretty right. linear. That's a pretty exciting one. Yeah. Going back to the Chicago, you know, the pre-zoning. Right. And that's what I mean is like, I look at that and go, we learned these lessons so early. This should be so applicable now. <laughs> yeah. But at the same time, then I thought about, again, your points of, I mean, obviously we need to, look, the, so many of these problems of ours require what I call the kitchen sink approach or portfolio approach, which isn't mm -hmm. just like for hunger. It's not just feed people tonight. It's also draft legislation. So there's not as much food waste or, or you know, the farm bill, all these different things. But in yeah, that, yeah. yeah. no, I was just going to say in this case, it's not just, we clearly need to build new transportation, but we also know yeah. how enormously expensive that can be. I mean, you look at the second Avenue subway in New York and in, in the past 20 years of that, it's, unbelievable yeah i mean the you're getting to the, the which i deal with in the book a number of ways there's always this let's build a line let's extend out a line and see how that goes and that'll track people but what the history of transit tells you is something else right which is that a line will only prosper right to the extent that development can al happen alongside it to basically take advantage of this new amazing piece of infrastructure. And that's why actually the second Avenue extension, at least in 96th street was a pretty good investment because sure. you get a couple hundred thousand people out of it. So that's good. You know, it's a few billion dollars, whatever, 6 billion that came out, but you're actually getting riders, but you have examples, so many examples after the heyday of transit in our current world, right? Basically since the federal government started paying for this stuff in the 60s, certainly the 70s and to today, where basically you have extensions of lines, like really nice, like honestly, you know, our light rail lines are awesome and they're beautiful and the rest. The problem is that there's no, like you're talking about the kitchen sink, right? It's oops, we forgot to zone, <laughs> take there's advantage. Oh, there's nobody there. And if you do, or we do this like park and ride crap, you know, like where basically people drive their cars there, but that's like your capacity is pretty limited, right? Sure. You know, a few thousand, maybe you get a few thousand cars in a parking lot if you're lucky, but that's tough. And then we don't do the, you know, some cities like Portland did a better job. LA's trying the kind of, and Boston, you know, the feeder bus, right? You want to feed the buses in, but if you don't have a bus network, you can't feed people to the transit lines to get them up. So we've done a lot. There's actually been a pretty impressive amount of rail extension in the US since the 70s. Unfortunately, most of those underperform because they often run through like disused rail corridors, you know, or they run through areas that are fundamentally not great transit markets. So you're right, you have to like, you know, deal with, you have to deal with the zoning at one time, right? You have to deal with housing discrimination. You have to make sure that there's affordable at nights. And by the way, if you build all luxury housing, this is the studies have all shown this. If you build a whole bunch of luxury housing with parking underneath it, you don't get a lot of riders. You say, oh, it's transit oriented development. Yeah, it's transit adjacent, as they say. Yeah. Yeah. But if everyone could just store their car underneath, right? You don't get that many riders. So you have to make sure that there's working class housing as part of that as well. And then the other big piece the all kitchen sink thing is, you know, it could be a beautiful rail line, but if that thing shows up like once an hour, forget it. Sure. No one's, you know, it's got to be like a six minute headway, maybe 10. And like a lot of times a day, if it shuts down at 11, 12 o'clock at night, good luck with that. Well, so you're absolutely the, right. Yeah. yeah. And that's one of the things we saw, I believe it was the new Boston mayor who apparently is fantastic. And mm -hmm. one of the things I believe, and again, I might destroy this. One of her first things she did was to I think keep a lot of the public transit free like they had incentivized during COVID. Mm -hmm. And that's great on the one hand, but it seems like the more persuasive argument is we just need more of it. Like you said, these things yeah. have to come at a max of 10 minutes. Otherwise people are going, what am I doing here? Free for crap. I mean, it doesn't right. help anyone, right? I mean, you can offer people free things, but if I can't get to my job in a reasonable amount of time or pick up my kid or you know get on and off, right? Free doesn't help, right, that much. I will say this, I mean, I think the fair model, which Boston is working on and some mm -hmm. other cities have done, which is like an income graded piece sure. that, you know, that makes sense. But right, the free fair model works better in a city like Boston, in essence, already, because you have more transit that they preserved. You know, that's that chapters on Boston is like, sure. you can talk about free fares when you've gotten to a level of like subsidy that's pretty unbelievable by American standards. And that's the key, right? Because if <laughs> yeah. you're reducing fares, that means it's yeah. reduced revenue. So it's got to come from somewhere yeah. or you've got shitty service. So right. where do you feel like, because again, uh, like you said, it's, uh, you know, we, we seem to be agreement on the kitchen sink approach. Yeah. There are some places where we're starting to see, mm -hmm. like you said, finally in California, some up zoning in a lot of different yep. ways. We're seeing yep. in a few places, parking minimums go away, yep. which is very exciting yep. to me. 
But obviously, this is not a revolution yet, but those are really important pieces of the puzzles. They, are. Are you, they will have long-term, yeah. yeah no, They'll have long-term just, effects, yeah. Do you feel like you're starting to see more subsidization in local and state places? I mean, obviously, state houses are going in two different directions. Well, days, but... the COVID piece was great from the federal money. I mean, that was the only, since the 1970s is the first time we've had significant federal operating support. And you know, that made a difference for so many people who need to get to jobs and still do. And it's basically saved transit up to this point. And then we do see like California just bailed out Bay Area transit with some important pieces. New York has just bailed out the MTA at New York State. So the states do have the funding or at least the taxing or other capabilities, congestion charging, whatever it is, to basically put transit on a much more stable basis. So we do see some of that. City government, though, good luck on that. I mean, I don't, I think they're headed for such big problems, you know, with, you know, downtown real estate values, with the work from home thing and other stuff like that. I mean, I wouldn't want to depend on city governments. And that's one of the problems with free fair so far is that a lot of this is driven by city councils and mayors who are basically going to be facing major financial problems. So if they can get it, I will say this, if you can get a kind of free fair component, like New York's going to do a couple bus lines with the state deal. Great. That works because this, you know, basically that's money that's covering, right. This experiment. But if you don't have that, depending on city government will be very difficult. By the way, although that's not to say, you know, a city like San Francisco and Boston, they have had basically local tax revenues, which have gone to support transit for decades and decades. And that has basically helped them in the dips sure. and the sort of, you know, to basically not have to cut. Because the whole problem is what, when you start cutting, you know, that's when people start abandoning transit, right? It's like when you can't depend on it, you start thinking, it might cost me 30, 40 percent of my income to have a car, but I need to have a job. I, you know, I, and so they're going to do that. And that's understandable. I empathize yeah, with that. Totally, you know, totally. We have so many, again, choices that have compounded on choices, often on purpose in this country, to create systems that are very harmful and inescapable, most important being number two there for a lot of folks, right? Whether it's food or air pollution or heat or whatever, or healthcare, or whatever it might be. But sometimes there is an alternative, and sometimes that alternative is then I got to get a car, but it's incredibly unaffordable. Now, you have to pay for parking. The $700 is the like average. Things. But for, the point is, for some people, it's either I don't have health care or I do, right. especially in these states that won't pass, take the federal Medicaid mm -hmm. money. But in most places, you can figure out some version of the car thing or you don't. And you see people working. And this is my thing that's you're totally right. This office commercial real estate thing is going to be a nightmare at some point. I mean, I was just looking at numbers this week that said in some of these studies, it's like 25, 35 percent vacancy rates, which is incredible. Right. They're going to reassess all that rates property. Are double what they were, et cetera. Yeah. But. There's also huge numbers of people, though, that need transportation that don't work in these big office buildings, yeah. right? They're in service jobs and things like that in these hourly jobs all around cities that require things like this. Go ahead. You know, there are other institutions that can take a role in this. You know, cities obviously don't have a lot of money, but most American cities, the biggest employers now are nonprofit hospital and university systems. And I would say nonprofit in quotes, yeah. they somehow have millions of dollars for their executives and so forth. Sure. And <clears throat> what they can do to support transit in this case, a lot of their service workers, like you mentioned, and there are some that do it. MIT does it, the universities in Pittsburgh do it. There are other cities. You can buy, they can buy transit in bulk. That is passes for their workers mm -hmm. and give them to them for free. Because currently the transit benefit, it can be used for parking or transit. Your $300 a month tax-free withdrawal, it can be used for parking or transit. So you know what a lot of these institutions have done. <clears throat> they built massive parking complexes. Yep. Right. It's enormous. And if they said, you know, you know, we're going to give you, you know, free transit pass, that could be a game changer, I think, for many cities. But they'd have to, in the all in the kitchen sink thing, they'd have to work with a transit agency to make sure that there's sufficient service, that people would be able to really use it to go to the kind of dispersed metropolis where it is. I mean, that's one example of something that can be done. There are, I mean, there are examples of cities which are building kind of clusters of housing along their transit lines. But again, you know, that has to be done with an eye to not providing an all this parking as part of it. So I do think the parking, and Henry Graybar's book is great. You know, I think this is, the parking component is crucial. If you provide 
subsidized, you have subsidized cheap parking competing with subsidized transit. And, you know, because of how Americans now live, mostly subsidized parking is going to win. That's a tough one. It the is. key is, oh, sorry, sorry. No, I was just agreeing with you. I mean, I think of obviously Paris is one example. They've just been yeah. nibbling and nibbling. Yeah, take away the, the side, the street parking. Like, yeah, because it, it, it really is supply and demand on all these different yeah. fronts from the public transportation to parking to highways to housing and all these things. And if you make it away, difficult, you can drive. Yeah, if you, you got to make it worse and worse. And you also got to sit tight when people scream. Yeah, because what's going to happen for a long time. Yeah. I remember, oh, God, still what was the parking. transportation commissioner when I was there? Khan, I believe. Janet City Khan, yeah. Holy shit, did, were people so mad at this one? Yeah, I mean, mad. oh, my God. And now look at it. I mean, they've made just enormous. Obviously, yeah. congestion pricing has taken like 20 years to get going, but yeah. they have, it has made a difference what they've done. It has. And we still have millions of like on street free parking. And, you know, if they start pulling that <laughs> or charging yeah. for it, yeah. you can fund transit easily. And some studies have done, you can easily fund transit with that. So those are, but it will take a kind of political courage that is difficult for people who have to answer to voters. But it also is going to require, and this is again, something I harp on a lot, like the subsidies part really sticks with me because yeah. among the many things I try to help already our audience understand when they say, what can I do? It is often to start with understanding what we subsidize and to what extent. And on the other hand, the costs we still and historically just steadfastly refuse to even calculate, much less right. pay. So Massachusetts, there's a study from Harvard right. Kennedy School, they was it $64 billion a year in auto related costs to the whole system of maintaining auto infrastructure. I mean, I don't sure, you know, but, but that it's a massive the pollution part and the, the and externalities. Yeah. Things. Like, we refuse to calculate externalities for anything we do. I yeah. mean, that's why the SEC has taken so long on, on making one single rule about this stuff. Yeah. You know, so I wonder, because, you know, as you pointed out, San Francisco and Boston and New York, imperfect, obviously, but there's some examples there of maybe some things we can learn from as far as mm -hmm. what small or big cities hopefully subsidized by the state, because like you said, city councils can be a nightmare. What is What are transferable lessons there that we can use as we try to pick this thing apart? Like I mean, where first did, where is- Where is effective? Where do they come from? You know? Yeah, so there, people, I do think that the transit advocates in those cities pretty early had a pretty good, had a very good idea and they stuck to it of what transit offered in terms of social equity or, you know, basically that that was a really important, like you look at talk about New York, right? You know, the subway is a form of transportation, but it was also a form of reform, which was, we want to get people out of the tenements, right? In horrible conditions. So we're going to build the subway. We're going to subsidize the, these private companies to basically get people out. And, you know, that is, that's crucial, right? So I have a vision, right? And the same in, you know, in Boston, the idea was like the working class needs this. We have to, basically subsidize it to keep because most people can't afford a car that's back in the 20s and san francisco of course had left-wing movements that were very important almost you know uh, the sense of like the greater good that would be served by basically destroying the private transit company with a public alternative and so they had that they also were unapologetic and this includes both transit advocates and politicians that you know paying for this out of a sales tax, a property tax element, whatever it is, or state tax, that this was just the cost of maintaining these systems over time. You have to, you never should apologize for this because it's a round, it's a small, it's, you know, we, the numbers sound big, you know, like millions sure, here, or, or, right? Yeah. Right. The aggregate, they sound big because you're serving many people across in one system and they aren't dispersed and things like that. But the truth is, they were, you know, in these cities, transit has never been one of the big cost factors compared to schools or policing or whatever else these cities were doing. So I do think you have to be unapologetic. I think you do have to compromise and make deals very often with the suburbs. So sometimes you do end up with systems which, you know, maybe it's not exactly fair. You know, suburbs do get something in it, you know, but then the city gets that funding. But I do think aiming for what's really important is operating funding. And I think that gets often overlooked because, you know, this whole idea of building the shiny thing, it attracts city leaders, it attracts suburban leaders, oh, this like fancy line, whatever. 
But what matters most in my telling, and I think of my research and my findings is, does that bus show up or that tram show up every five minutes? And it can be the oldest damn tram you've ever seen, right? You go to yeah. Boston, they're running like 1940s, 50s equipment yeah. on this one line, the Mattapan line. You just keep modernizing it. And like in, in San Francisco, they ran these old trolley coaches. Boston, I when I lived there years ago, there were old trolley coaches, like the electric trolley, like ele- electric buses, which are now hot, right? Sure. You know, these have been running for almost, you know, 100 years in some, almost right. in some Don't cases. Don't tell anybody, it's super old technology. It's super old tech. That's the key, you know, it doesn't have to be fancy. Just it just to has to be there. And there's work. nothing worse than like a cold night and the thing doesn't show up. And you know what? If you got to wait outside for a cold, beautiful, you know, light rail line, nobody wants that. And you want you that old bus shows up and it, you know, goes along like a July. Who cares? Get me there. That's what well, I want. Can also be and like, that's operating. That's yeah, operating. And I understand. And again, having been in, in New York and I was in London when they started congestion pricing, like I was a Forrest Gump of bouncing around all these places trying to pull it together. Yeah. Los Angeles gets the Olympics and they go, how the hell are we going to redo all of our transportation in time for this? You know, it's funny. I was just thinking when you're talking, it's a ridiculous analogy, but I think my children got a dog three years ago and they thought this was really great. And I was like, now we have to take care of it. You have to feed yes, it. And yes. you have to clean up the poop. And <laughs> I like, use that same one. Whoa, I do that too. Oh, And I'm like, guys, that's the deal. Like you can't just, it's not just the shiny puppy. That's great. But you got to walk it. You got to pick up the yeah, stuff. And they're like grumbling yeah. about it. I'm like, then I guess we'll get rid of the dog. No. So, Mine is, you know, you, you, the, it's the amount of time to build it is nothing. It pales totally. in comparison to the amount of time you will maintain that system. Yeah, and unless and- you have a steady flow of money, whether it's fares or a company, usually it's a combination of fares and subsidies, it's not going to work. And it's obviously that balance is going to be adjustable over time, depending on how it's doing and how much maintenance is required. Are cars aging out over a period of time? How does it amortize? Every city's a little bit different because some got light rail, some are underground entirely, some buses. But obviously, the combination is really the key, right? How is it frequent? How is it fair? How is it subsidized? And buses, I mean, you can get to a decent bus system pretty quickly compared to rail. And that's why, actually, I think it's very exciting now. I think everyone should support... You know, these bus rapid transit opportunities, I don't know if you've been to Richmond lately, but it's getting a lot of attention for its bus rapid transit. And, you know, what does it do? You know, it's, you know, it's got, you know, its own lanes for part of it. It's frequent service. It's modern. It's not too, you don't have to have rails. And that is really, you know, that's the new thing. And, and they also have the density around those spots and workplaces. And, and that works. Fruit. Relative yeah. to building new lines, you know, yeah. it's not as sexy, but man, it really works. I do want to talk a minute because, you know, so a friend of mine is working in government and is responsible for paying out some of this infrastructure cash, Mm -hmm. of which there's a lot. And it's frustrating because you've also got, we have all these incremental pieces, and again, there's going to be trade-offs, but you've got Houston getting this $10 billion, I think, highway expansion, right? And they're demolishing something like a thousand homes. It's a Mm -hmm. billion degrees there today. I think it's like $100 billion of the infrastructure deal is going to highway and bridge programs, but it seems to be based on these old models and these old formulas that we haven't adjusted along the way. And I just, again, I wonder, it's so hard. It's like when someone, the smaller example, someone buys a gas car now, we're keeping cars for something like 12 years now, the longest we ever have. Right. It's, or someone putting in a furnace again instead of a heat pump you're going like that's one that's just now locked in for another 12 years right how do we work around those things that are going to be big setbacks (laughs) how do we stop us from like building in another general a new generation yeah yeah i mean i think you've hit it which is we're building an entire new infrastructure a car oriented infrastructure whether electric or gas and you know, that's not, that means basically because electric cars are so expensive at this point, the charging infrastructure is not there. We are locking ourselves in for probably decades, right, of of the car culture with all that it brings with it. I, you know, there is money for transit in there, but it's, again, it's for like mostly for new construction of lines. There is a push to have some of the federal capital money be used for operating, but yeah, I don't know that Americans are serious. I mean, I hate to say it, but I think it just gets down to that idea that Americans are still in denial about the contribution of the car culture to 
and which is really the truck culture because very few people actually drive like cars anymore yeah. but or whatever but the contribution of the car culture to the climate crisis and until we pass whatever that point is you know people just can't see that i mean think about all the ink spilled on electric cars at this point and you know it wasn't even gm and these companies so much right i mean it was there's this kind of shiny object like we can do all of this. We can have this sort of utopia without any sacrifice. And that has, I guess, something to do with like American consumer culture more generally. You know, the, I mean, a bus even, I mean, buses are way better than electric cars. Rail is way better. I mean, but getting people to think about like taking those things, subsidizing them, it's a big challenge. You probably need a kind of, we do have really good transit advocacy organizations right now, but I would definitely say if there are any funders, hello, of like large foundations, start dumping some money. I mean, look at Bloomberg and, you know, smoking and things like that. Although, yeah, you know, hasn't had... we are really from 15 minute groceries to whatever you want to call it, to going to the emergency room every time we're sick, like convenience is such a big right. part of right. this country. But it's funny because the driving has also gotten so inconvenient in many cases, but we're not willing to try the alternative because in a lot of ways the alternative isn't there and the or it's not better or it's yeah. not better and the long-term effort much less mindset to or I guess reverse those long-term mindset much less effort to actually fix it to build a better system requires on itself so much effort there's not a lot of questions here it's mostly me venting to you i'm realizing at this <laughs> <time>. <laughs> that's fine that's fine uh, i mean i think that's the uh, i want to be clear there's a lot of wins there's some really great stuff happening like you said there's amazing transit organizations there's really great supporters parking minimums are going away california yeah. passing i think the zoning reform the parking minimum piece but yeah. i will say this that is not going to yield much for a long time sure no that you're not you don't get riders very quickly because you know, you got to change the zoning. You got to get the financing to build the stuff. The people have to move in. They have to realize that it's because they're all going to bring their cars with them initially. So we're looking at 10 to 20 years before you'd really see neighborhoods, I think. I mean, there are a few exceptions, you know, where neighborhoods are already getting dense in some places, but that's pretty limited because so many places have put the parking under these well, new the four over ones. If you, you know? don't up zone and take away or at least drastically reduce parking minimums, it's just the same shit. It's the same stuff. It doesn't change anything because it's so convenient. They literally, you can in the, you know, what is it? These new apartment complexes, you can literally drive to your door. So you have the equivalent, like in these ramps, right? You drive like right up to your door. And so it's the equivalent of a vertical ranch house, right? right? Oh. It's like, you just like, all you have to do is do a couple turns and you pull right up at your house. I don't know how transit competes with that. That's a pretty tough it's sell. It's yeah. yeah. Uh, cost wise. I mean, I do think cost is something. I mean, I think the... Although it's deeply subsidized the e-cars and all the rest of it, but I do think the car, the costs of, you know, was it 700 for an average car payment now? You know, it's unbelievable, right? I think that because income's not giving up, I think there may be more and more people will find themselves not only house poor in the U.S., but car poor. And I sure. think that a lot of people who didn't ever think of transit before, like I think about, you know, people talk about, oh, you know, San Francisco's got all these problems now, right? Because all these tech workers aren't there. And I was thinking, you know. I mean, they weren't right. Transit was going down before the pandemic because the tech workers had so much money. They were like Ubering everywhere and, oh, you know, yeah. like that sort of thing. So it's, you know, transit actually coming back a bit in San Francisco, considering how few people are going into San Francisco's downtown. I'm actually very nicely surprised at how many people are actually riding transit hmm. because it's miserable to drive there. It's miserable to park. It's yeah. extremely expensive to live there. So, you know what you think? I think I'm going to ride transit, right? And so that you have to get to that, like somewhere, that crucial moment, right? That threshold where like people finally go, there's something running in front of my house. I don't know what it is. It seems to be a large object and you can get on and pay or not or whatever, right? And I might actually get on that thing and might benefit from it. And I am broke. <laughs> I don't have a lot of money if I don't want to hire paying for it. Or I'm just cheap. Maybe I'm just cheap and I'm tired yeah. of putting all this money in Elon Musk's you know, hands. It's wild because we often say these things out loud. Again, I remember being in L.A., you know, Uber, Lyft, and people wouldn't take public transportation, and it wasn't good enough at that point. They weren't really thinking about it. They hadn't rebuilt a lot of the bus stuff yet. There was no apps to be able to tell when things were coming, yeah. this and that. And, you know, again, this was a time of that question of then I would have to walk to where I was going. 
And at the same time, you're going, you got drive through traffic. You got to find parking when you get there. You got to yeah. pay for parking. People don't count that time. No, it's, it's been studied. Again, they don't count don't, that time. They count, they count only that little bridge, like when they're driving. They yeah. don't count the time to your right. car, drive, you know, that's no, a lot. They don't count the 20 bucks it costs to park at a doctor's no, office for that. an appointment that takes 15 minutes because healthcare is broken. Different conversation. We won't get yeah. into it. But, yeah. you know, it's fascinating because we do need to come to terms a little bit with different imperfect systems that have some friction but are more beneficial to the these greater goals right i'll give you a metaphor for or not a metaphor, metaphor but like an example i don't know it's really a metaphor but anyway i lived in new orleans before katrina and i was helping run a program at tulane called the urban village and we brought in somebody from the Army Corps of Engineers to talk about the defense systems for flooding, you know? And I remember that the, you know, his laptop was having problems that worried me right there. But anyway, and in New Orleans at that time, we were all very interested. This was before Katrina. You know, there was a lot of kind of, we don't want these walls around the city in the same way, you know, because it's going to have environmental effects. It's going to be ugly. We don't want any of this. And then Katrina happened. Now I was, I moved to New York by then. And the city is flooded. It's decimated. And what do they do then? They say, Army Corps of Engineer, what do you need to do? And how much do we need to spend to do this? And I hate to say it, but I think that's how it's going to go with the climate crisis and mass transit, which is that right now we're in this sort of like you know delusion that there's some kind of no frictionless car oriented like way to get us to like low, <laughs> lower emissions, even though it's very clear that the complexity of creating all these D cars and charging them and the road systems and all the rest of it and the tires, all the, it's just awful. But we are so enamored with the idea that there's an easy fix or that there's, it's going to happen the way we want it, but that's not what's going to happen. And I, when I, those days that happen, like with the, you know, the smog here in New York, but the flooding at Sandy and, you know, when it's time, there's going to be a lot of hard. I mean, this sounds apocalyptic in a way, but I don't think it is. I think we're going to have, the politicians and everybody are going to have to say, you know, we thought we could do it with electric cars or we thought we could do it with this way, but this is it. You know, we're either going to have a habitable planet or not. And the only way every, the research I have seen recently says habitable planet, you don't get there if every American keeps driving an SUV. It just doesn't happen. Or even a car. You've got to have transit as a component of it. That's it. You just do. And again, it's going to take a lot of upfront money and it's going to take ongoing yep. dedicated money. And work maybe we'll have it. Maybe we won't. Things, but there's really <laughs> no way to ignore. This is a third of our collective footprint. Full right. stop. So yeah. that's a big number. Yeah. And when you start yeah. to take that down, it makes a big difference. And it also, and again, separate conversation, but my job as a generalist who is not a scientist or journalist or any of these things is helping people understand how these things intersect, whether you can you know, assume them from the surface level or not. But we have a loneliness epidemic. And when you were in right. your car by yourself on these commutes, it's not super healthy. And also no. you're not moving and you're more sedentary. Yeah. And we have all these issues that, again, it there are no silver bullets to any of these things. And if they were, we definitely would do them, certainly. But you also want to show people that these are what they call multi-solving level opportunities to improve things on a variety of measures. Yeah, it's absolutely. very easy to see that all of our pre-existing asthma and other cardiorespiratory, cardiopulmonary yeah. conditions made COVID much more fatal here than it ever needed to be. Um, like we're an athleisure society that doesn't walk, you know, like everyone's, oh, wearing, like, everyone's wearing athleisure yeah. everywhere this and they're like getting in their cars. Also, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, Use your athleisure to go to the transit stop and then ride. And, yeah. Yeah. It's that's a hard a, one. A, It's hard to break habits. It's hard to break systems. Obviously these are easier choices for a lot of us than some of us who are otherwise trapped in them. The other piece them. is I'll say this is, you know, for people who, you know, what really has worried me about the abandonment of transit, and I ride transit myself, is that you have basically this, we go back to the racial and social divisions, right? You're not, if your world becomes this bubble, right, of, you know, the suburbs that you're in, you know, where you basically don't share space in a way where people are not serving you in a way, like you're actually sharing an experience where they're not just the service worker or something like you're that. You're dependent. 
I think that, and I think there's some research indicating this, that empathy and your ability to understand what people go through is very different if you actually share space, schools, transit, libraries, like that. And we have not, we're not a terribly empathetic society. So I would say you could, there, there is potential in transit for all those folks who are interested in a more just society, you know, that, you know, riding transit will definitely bring you in contact with people who you maybe don't have contact with every day. And that might be a good thing. Might not be a great thing always. It's not always no, a great it's thing. Not, but... They're all imperfect, but it's 70% yeah. of the reason I send my kids who are just wildly privileged to public school. Because I'm like, yeah. good luck. That's life. That's what it's like out there. You know? Yeah. Same reason my 10-year-old wants to be a paleontologist. I was like, that's great. And I'm so excited for you, but you're going to be a waiter first because you need to learn how to be in the show. <laughs> the world and you got to learn yeah. how to like literally work for your money. Yeah. And yes, sir. No, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah. That wasn't. We sound answer. grumpy, I guess. You know, I guess we do sound a little like grumpy dads in the, uh, you mean, know, got to work. I that guy. But again, like I said, this has turned <laughs> Go into ride the bus. All right. Fewer yeah. questions. That's right. Yeah, go drive the bus. How great would it be if you were just like, I mean, I drive one of those F750 <laughs> Raptors, but it's fine. No, I mean, look, it is a deeply problematic hole we are in that is very complex but again i try to and the listeners get this we don't shy away from hard conversations here there's often fun yeah. ones I t again i always use this example there's a young woman i talked to recently who has don't even get me started with how this even begins she's figured out how to use sound cannons on drones all autonomously linked to push wildfires back and i was like yeah. listen I don't have any idea what you're talking about, but this sounds great. And I hope everybody supports you. That's just insane. It's, you know, I talked to these other, these uh, women scientists a couple of years ago who are using, figured out they could use zebra fish to try to fight pediatric cancer. And I'm like, that's great. I don't even know where you buy a zebra fish, much less how you use it for cancer. Yeah. These are incredible opportunities to fix these horrible things. And this is less sexy than those, but at the same time, it fundamentally applies to so many pieces of our society, which is an opportunity. We yeah. could tax zebra fish. I mean, that would be like a congestion, congestion, congestion zebra. Like, well, there's all too the, many of the. All the zebra fish moved to Texas because they didn't want to pay income taxes. <laughs> it's a nightmare. Yeah. No, it's it, there is some kvetching obviously going on, but I think it is though, like your book, to bring it all the way back around. Yeah. It's important to like fully reckon with what we the bed we've made and why and how so that we can tear it apart and look at it and go, okay, how do we reverse these choices along the way? Yeah, we still live in a system. small d democracy and sure. you have opportunities to vote for, to put things on ballots and to vote for people who will support these things. And I've seen it in my own, you know, last few years here. I mean, you look at a state like New York, there was a lot of question whether the MTA would bail out or whether the state would bail out the MTA. Sure. And, you know, because downstate, because New York City was so in, for the governor, Governor Hochul, you know what? She delivered. Yeah. yeah. It was a priority. It was a delivered. And that's what you got to do. People got to vote. Where there's transit, they need to vote. And where they're not, we'll hope. But. It's one of my favorite organizations is run by a friend of mine, Amanda Littman. It's called Run for Something. And all they do is recruit and support young, progressive state yeah. and local candidates, essentially. And often it's the people who have experienced these things the most. They have been a nurse or they are people who need to ride transit so they can speak right. to what that experience is and why it matters. And what happens when you start to put those people in office from the ground up? It's not yeah. only do they hopefully graduate to the House of Representatives or whatever it might be, but they can start to affect things on a way that you will feel and you will notice. And we always talk about, look, you know, Nick, you're not gonna stop the jet stream from slowing down here. But the climate change is the heat you feel on your back. It's the water you drink. It's the air right. you breathe. And you can actually affect those things. And doing it on the local level and the state level really does matter. Especially for something like transit, which yeah. historically has been funded in its operations at that level. Right. I mean, yeah, it's a tough lift of the federal level right now to get new operating subsidies for transit. But there's definitely, because of the importance of city economies to regions, it's a doable lift. Right. It is. And everywhere is complex and has its own complexities. And I think about I've got an Apple note full of 7000 links and things I'm going to eventually sell to where I am now, which is it seems like small potatoes. But we've got the city of Williamsburg, which is not yeah. very large. It is surrounded by an area called James City County. It's integrated with the world's largest open air museum, Colonial Williamsburg, which yes. is a nonprofit foundation. But yes. 10 feet this way 
is a state university, the College of William and Mary, yeah. and all these pieces uh, have could to totally work, work for transit. It could totally work, and you've already got again. Colonial Williamsburg is shut down to cars. It's already walkable. You've right. The College of right. William and Mary campus, great with but a pedestrian. It's complicated. But every time you pull a string, you find out more things, which is you can go to the city of Williamsburg and say, where's all your protected bike lane guys? And they go, here's yeah. the deal. The largest landowner is a nonprofit foundation, which doesn't pay property taxes. We've got a state university. There's, again, it's Colonial Williamsburg. So there's all these 400-year-old churches that take up land that also don't pay property taxes. They're like, we would love to build those things. We don't have any <laughs> money to do that. Yeah. But these are the pieces that should come together. Because you go to the endowment of Colonial Williamsburg and say, hey, guys, yeah. you want tourism to go back up to what it was before 2008 and 2018? Then yeah. you got to start making the entire entity better. You get more college students. You get younger people to work downtown. Mm -hmm. All these pieces. That's just what Universities have a good, I can say, I mean, resorts like Disney and also universities actually have a pretty, in terms of their own circulator systems. Sure. So in some places like Ann Arbor and so forth, I mean, they're moving like a lot of people. Yeah. So there's definitely you have enough institutional mojo there to basically put together circulator systems that could be very effective. But again, you'd have to do things like make sure that it's not too easy, you know, <laughs> to drive to the whatever the Winn Dixie or whatever it is yeah. there and that sort of thing. But yeah, you should be you could be such a beautiful and wonderful bikeable, walkable, tr enough yeah. transit for those who need it kind of system. Absolutely. Yeah. It's it it's easy to walk in and show them like a fancy PowerPoint and say make the, this four hundred year old town give it fiber internet and make it super bikeable yeah. and that's great but or put the charging it, stations in yeah exactly but not too many you know that's it's right. complicated <laughs> but it it is doable and again my goal is to try to keep finding as we talked about a little bit offline like what are lowest common denominator pieces of the puzzle that we can transplant from city and state to say this works these arguments work these are the pieces that help fund it to try to, again, have these things build on each other. Because I think livability, what you bring up there is, I think for a city like yours, is the livability factor. Sure. It can be a very big one to leverage transit and so forth. I mean, if you really have the kind of, because I mean, if, if, a lot of times traffic can be, even though you live in a small place because you have limited roads, it can be yeah. just awful. Yeah, and again, my perspective is skewed coming from Los Angeles. You know, if yeah. you're four minutes late to preschool, it's going to take half an hour to get there, but... <laughs> anyways, anyways, there's I think there's some glimmers out there, but it's gonna be a lot to undo. You know, your hundred and twenty five thousand book. We're gonna have to make it a thing of the past here, Nick. All right, you've spent enough time. I got a couple questions I'm gonna ask you that I ask everyone, and then we're gonna get you yeah. out of here. Okay. Does that sound good? That's great. Um, Nick, when was the first time in your life when you realized you had the quote unquote power of change, or the power to do something that you felt was outwardly meaningful? It could have been. Recently, it could have been your book, it could be teaching, could be any of these things. Hmm. Where was a spark for you? I, mean, I was involved pretty early in college in the 80s in the Earth Day organizations and helped organize, this is in Madison, Wisconsin, Earth Day celebrations, which, you know, it's, it's such a different time where really environmentalism was, you know, such at the margins, but we would put those together every year. And that was, you know, it was both my own awareness and our ability to drive other awareness around that. So I feel like that's where the idea that you can organize and develop something of meaning for people on a social issue of importance that sure. went. I would say that though, I mean, certainly through teaching, I feel like that's my impact. I've taught so many thousands of students now and you know, the teaching piece of it, I've been very lucky in the sense that I'm able to teach in areas like urban planning and urban affairs and so forth, which, you know, you're able to bring a kind of consciousness to students about things like longstanding racial disinvestment and inequity, but also opportunities for making better places, right? By showing them what's going on in Europe or in certain cities, there are tremendous opportunities there. So I think that teaching remains, you know, an opportunity for so many people to basically get ideas in circulation that can really help consciousness in that way. I love that. That's fantastic. Nick, who is someone who has positively impacted your work in the past six months? <laughs> I don't know. <sighs> in the past six months. Getting That's pretty specific here. That is, that is the kind of, let me think a little bit of yeah, who's take your positive. Time. There's a reason, me. there's a lot of reasons we're not live, but that's one of them. <laughs> I mean, 
I've be become. Let's see. Would be the most positive. I mean, I was able to bring the book to more people's attention because, like, of David Zipper, who's a freelance writer with Bloomberg and so forth. Otherwise, you know, this is a pretty, you know, it's a university press book, which is great. But that was his basically attention that he paid to the book in Vox and Bloomberg mm -hmm. was able to basically help create, you know, an audience for what was really a, you know, something that I felt very strongly about and researched a long time to a wider audience and tell a story that I think need to be told right now. And I was so grateful to him because we're going through a period where almost every state has to decide whether they're going to fund transit. And so it's nice to be able to say, here's, here's what happens if you don't. <laughs> My book's a warning, right? Yeah. So I owe him a lot. And I think actually the country owes him a lot in that way, because he's out there on a lot of issues, you know, and in terms of environment, I think he's got a lot of sense about what could really have impact, you know, whether it's he's big on e-bikes, He's somewhat skeptical of, you know, the electric car is going to solve everything, you know, those sorts of things. And so a lot of how reshaping cities can be better places. So I, I definitely admire his ability to communicate with a wider public in that way. I love that. The e-bikes thing is a whole thing we haven't even dug in. I love it. I have one. I love it. I'm obsessed with it. Um, it's my last mile solution. It's how I go to my train station. I, love it. I live up a hill. And so it's a really big hill. And so in the night, it's turn it on. Oh, yeah, it's cheating. It's, it's awesome. fantastic. Yeah, it's wild to look at things like the subsidies in Colorado that started in Denver, and they've—I think they just passed the entire state yeah. of Colorado for yeah. e-bikes. They can't—they literally cannot keep these subsidies, I guess, in stock as you were. It's pretty incredible. Last one: What is a book that has you've read in the book you've read in the past year or so that has opened your mind to maybe a topic you hadn't considered before, or has changed your thinking in some fundamental way, or at least challenged? You? I'm a little old for that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a little baked in. I don't know. <laughs> totally changed my thinking. I don't or know. Or just I, a new I, idea where you're like, shit, I'd never read about this. What? Uh, that's exciting. I mean, I like the Jeff Speck, you know, the walkable, the, I'm trying to get, give, give, give me the the title in a minute. I was just rereading that. Is it I'm looking. walkable city? Yeah, I have it just it. walkable city? Right. Isn't that what it I, is? I think it is walkable, walkable city, city rules. Yeah, walkable city. Yeah. yeah, yeah Which, yeah. by the way, I, I can't, walkable city rules, it's still so great. Yeah. Funny totally on target you know his description for instance of like state highway agencies and their ability to ruin cities love it and it's not just highways them but actually how the state routes like mm -hmm. he talks about because he's done a lot of this consultancy on walkability and you know he's, i know it's bad you know he's, he says i know it's gonna be bad if i have to deal with state officials on the route because while well, they're interested is getting you know cars from point a to point b so that's, I highly recommend that book and, you know, to rediscover it again. He's put a new, like an afterword, an update that's also very good. So I definitely feel like that's still like one that everyone should read if they want to get into kind of the transportation alternatives sure. kind of element. I love it. Thank you so much. Your book is The Great American Transit Disaster. It is a light beach read for everyone. There it is. <laughs> highly recommend it. I mean, just so many footnotes. It's great. <laughs> Thank you for, I mean, truly the work that must have been required to do this is unbelievable because the writing the book is hard, but it is the easy part. I mean, truly, you yeah. you pulled it all together. So well, we appreciate that. Thank you for your time. And yeah, go check out the book. And we've also got some other resources we'll put in the show notes for folks so they can really get a good education on this before they go start protesting. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. You can read our critically acclaimed newsletter and get notified about new podcast conversations and important, not important. Dot com. Thanks so much for listening, and thanks for giving a shit.